Scatter! Disperse! Run! Run! Get the fuck out of there! And well... Kept you guys waiting, huh? I'm The Voice Box, and welcome to another video. Before we jump into this analysis, I just want to give a big shout out to one of my subscribers, Guy Savage 3347 I personally don't like using social media, so if you guys wish to contact me, go on my About page, and if you have any interesting artwork or anything like that you wish to send me for me to animate in one of my next videos, just go to my email and send me the links on Google Drive. WHAT?! And if you watch any of my videos, guys, please consider subscribing. Subscribe to the channel, you spine bitch! Can you understand what it's like to know that you're garbage since the day you were born? Now I'll finish the work that father began. I will surpass him. I will destroy him. Goodbye, father. I don't need you anymore. He makes all fault to leave you. The terrible children. Your sons. They're no sons of mine. And they're sure as hell not me. Just a bunch of cells grown in a lab. What they are is much sicker than that. Love? It's hate! He always told me I was inferior. Learning the truth about himself, cursing the fact he's a clone, bearing a grudge against selfish adults, and coming to hate who he was cloned from. Big Boss. I was created by Cypher. And I was the floor. My fate was written in my genes. I'm the loser. You. All because of you! I'm not me. I'm just a copy of you. I'll kill all of Cypher. I'll destroy your precious world. I will kill you! I'm sorry. Your father never wanted you. Human life isn't meant to be manipulated like that. I knew that. I'm not a kid. You hear me? Get out of my mind, liquid! The most we can say about DNA is that it governs a person's potential strengths. Potential destiny. You mustn't allow yourself to be chained to fate. To be ruled by your genes. Humans can choose the type of life they want to live. In the integrate tapestry of existence, we find ourselves woven into the fabric of life. Each thread of our being intricately tied to the profound core that shapes our very essence, our genetics. As we embark on this exploration into the enigmatic realm of human identity, and that of Liquid Snake, we are confronted with the profound question to what extent do our genes define us? In the symphony of nature and nurture, our genetic makeup emerges as a silent architect, laying the foundation upon which the complex architecture of our individuality is constructed. Beyond mere blueprint of biological inheritance, genetics becomes a philosophical compass guiding us through the labyrinth of our existence. It whispers secrets encoded into the language of DNA, shaping not only our physical attributes, but also influencing the intricate dance of our thoughts, emotions, and predispositions. We are all compelled to confront the dualism of determination and free will, pondering whenever the strands of DNA weaving through ourselves dictate an immutable destiny, or whenever the canvas of our lives remains open to the strokes of our own choices and experiences. Liquid Snake's story is very tragic, it's a story of being tied to a genetic heritage which binds him to a dark legacy, one that isn't of his own, but one that has been created and shaped through the means of genetic manipulation. Liquid is a character whose anger and resentment are deeply rooted in his perception of his own genetic identity. Apparently his real name is Eli. He must feel like we stripped him of his whole identity. We'll let things simmer down. I put a guard on him for now. Still the question is, who is he? Where did he come from, and how has he survived? It isn't just the sense of his genetic inadequacy that fuels his resentment. It is more deeply rooted to the fact that he was created, not to be of his own, to grow and live a normal life, to have a purpose of his own. He realises that his heritage, his very existence, was taken from him. Whilst yes, genes don't dictate our free will and choices that we make, 
they don't tend to have a mind of their own, it's just like a computer that is programmed which gives us our structure and our design. But at the same time, Liquid Snake's free will was taken from him. The choice of being able to live an ordinary life wasn't a seemable thing, as he was designed to be a weapon. Liquid's identity is intricately tied to the legacy of Big Boss, and he struggles with the notion that he is merely just the clone created for specific military purposes. His quest for identity becomes a central theme in his character's arc as he seems to break free from his predetermined fate imposed by his genetic heritage. Deep down is a kindred spirit who yearns for recognition and validation. He craves acknowledgement from Big Boss, the figurehead he considers his father, and resents the fact that he feels overlooked in the favour of his own brother. His pursuit of his genetic code necessary to activate Metal Gear Rex is a part of a quest for recognition and acknowledgement that he believes he deserves and that his identity was stripped away from him. You don't have to deny it. We were created to be that way. Created? Les enfants terribles. The terrible children. That's what the project was called. It started in the 1970s. Their plan was to artificially create the most powerful soldier possible. One way to think about how our genes affect our fate is to use the concept of penetrance and expressivity. Penetrance is the proportion of individuals who carry out a certain gene variant who show the related trait, such as having a disease or a certain characteristic. Expressivity is the degree of expression of the trait, such as how severe or mild it is. For example, some people who have a faulty gene for breast cancer may not develop the disease, but they may still be at risk because they have the variant. This is called the reduced penetrance. On the other hand, some people who have a normal gene for eye colour may still have blue eyes, but they also may have brown eyes due to environmental factors. This is called variable expressivity. Another way to think about how genes affect our fate is to use the concept of free will and determinism. Free will is the idea that we can make choices based on our own consequences and deliberations and our own consciousness, and that we are responsible for our own actions. Determinism is the idea that everything that happens in the universe is predetermined by natural laws and casual relationships, and that we are not free to act otherwise. Some scientists claim that new discoveries have proved free will is an illusion, and that everything we do is influenced by our genes. However, this has been challenged by many philosophers and psychologists who argue that free will is compatible with determinism and that there are other factors beside genes that shape our choices. So in an essence, we can't necessarily say that all what Liquid Snake has stated is just talks from a madman. A lot of what he says is backed up by scientific evidence. That's right. We are all on the verge of death at the genetic level. We don't know when or what type of disease will occur. In nature, family members don't mate with each other, and yet they help each other to survive. Do you know why? It increases the chance that their genes will be passed on to a new generation. Altruism among blood relatives is a response to natural selection. It's called the selfish gene theory. The selfish gene theory is a gene-centered view of evolution that holds that adaptive evolution occurs through the differential survival of competing genes. The term was popularized by Richard Dawkins in his 1976 book, The Selfish Gene, based on the ideas of W.D. Hamilton and others. Selfish genes are genetic segments that can enhance their own transmission at the expense of other genes in the genome, even if this has no positive or net negative effect on organismal fitness. According to this theory, all behaviors in nature are driven by selfish or altruism, and organisms are essentially organic machines built by genes. Genes are the units of inheritance, not the creature, species, or population. Therefore, creatures, selfishness, and altruism are both rooted in gene selfishness. Genes also show their selfishness because of the fact that altruism towards outside groups is rare and toward different species is almost unheard of. Some of the examples of gene behavior are emperor penguins demonstrate the selfish behavior when they push each other in the water to check for predators before diving in themselves. Or bees demonstrate altruistic behavior when they sting to defend their hives while they may drive off creatures that would have eaten the hive's food source. The honey, the bees themselves often die in the process. 
A bird that gives an alarm call upon seeing a predator is being altruistic. Because the bird might draw the predator's attention to itself, it is relatively a small risk compared to that of a bee sting in intruder, but it still counts as altruism. A human killing another human is one of the worst crimes possible, but we kill animals every day for food in self-defense or simply for sport. Whilst bearing in mind that this Richard Dawkins book in 1976 is all based down on theory, it doesn't make it evidentially fact, although we can take out from what that book says to being true to the existence as being a species within this planet. The difference that separates us from unlike any other animal is that we have the ability to have higher consciousness to be able to think before we do. But humans are just like every other animal on the planet. Humans mate, humans are very territorial, and humans can be very selfish. And in terms of survival, survival of the fittest wins, usually the one with the most dominant genetics. And of course, through natural selection for the female to decide the better person who has the better genetics, in most cases, to guarantee for a healthier offspring. We can see how genetics do place a big emphasis on today's lifestyle, and especially more than ever by today's modern day standards. Genetics in terms of how you look and how your appearances can determine your success within the very existence of your human life. If such as your appearance, how intelligent you are, these are all determined by your genetics and within the success of your endeavors which can all greatly advance your success within this life. While some may consider free will to be a concept, an illusion, it's something that definitely exists and something that we as a human race are aware of. Unlike a shark that is just programmed to kill and doesn't feel any kind of emotion whatsoever or consequences of its actions, it responds basically down to what its genetics tell it to do and its instincts. I am certainly with the belief amongst many that our genetics are our core foundation. It is our programming, but it doesn't fully control our will and our conscious awareness to be able to make our own decisions and how we determine our life to be. There is many topics on Reddit regarding Liquid Snake. That very forum I tend to keep well away from, considering that at times it's hard to have a very rational and a logical conversation. When we're digging into the core essence of Liquid Snake's story, is it just a case of him being the antagonist? the all-out villain with daddy issues. Liquid's story goes deep and far into why he becomes the villain that he is branded. He is shaped and molded to become this way through life's experiences, driven into a world full of war and battle. There is no right and wrong, as there is death at every corner. Solid Snake, Liquid's brother, confirms this himself. There's no right part in murder. Not ever. Killing without guilt produces more carnage. In a war, all of mankind's worst emotions, worst traits emerge. Unlike Solid Snake, who wasn't obsessed with leaving behind a legacy of genetics and something to be remembered by, something that Liquid Snake would be obsessed with, and of course would haunt him and lead him to his eventual demise. Vision the pressure of inheriting the legacy of a legendary figure like Big Boss. Liquid's relentless pursuit to surpass his progenitor is fueled by a desperate desire to break free from the shadows cast by his predecessor. His anger stems from the overwhelming burden of living up to this legacy that was thrust upon him without consent. Unlike Solid Snake who was kept in the dark about his genetic heritage, Liquid Snake was fully aware and, quite clearly and understandably, very angry and full of hatred. Buried underneath all that is a craving for a father's embrace. Picture Liquid Snake genetically tethered to Big Boss, yearning for the warmth of his father's embrace. Despite their genetic code, he feels an emotional chasm, an estrangement that fuels his desire to be close to Big Boss, as any son would long to be with their father, and deep down is yearning for recognition as a son. Picture Liquid's anger as a manifestation of a deeper emotional wound, the longing for Big Boss to recognize him, not just as a soldier, but as a son. With Big Boss showing no interest of his sons whatsoever, Liquid's resentment towards his own father is naturally understandable. His actions are driven by the desire to surpass his own father, are a testament to his desperate plea for acknowledgement and acceptance and the fulfillment of the fundamental human need for parental guidance. And with that, explains the sins of the fathers that would eventually pass down onto the legacy of Liquid Snake that would make him to lead poor choices just like anybody else within life with a poor background and a bad upbringing. Eli has disappeared. Might as well call it abandoned. They're through with him. Where is he? He was in England, Zero's home ground. Apparently, he traveled to Africa after that, but that's where he escaped from Zero's care. Just like that? Why? Who knows? Maybe he found out about his birth. 
If he's alive, he'd be 11 or 12 by now. Old enough to think and act for himself. So he might still be alive? On his own? There? I wouldn't bet on it. John, if he is alive, what's the plan? I have nothing to say to him. Treat him like a human being, just another person. Since we can hear that Big Boss has no interest in playing the father figure, Ocelot also mentions that Liquid is capable of making his own decisions, almost like he's a man, but bear in mind he's still a kid, and is very impressive at that, being able to take on fully grown adults at his age, and lead his own militia unit within Africa during this time within Phantom Pain. There is no doubt that he is the son of Big Boss, and carries the genetics to be able to achieve and excel more than any of the soldiers in the world, but given on how inferior he feels, he feels like he is the recessive clone out of all the clones of Big Boss. His intellect is that of a genius, possessing an IQ of 180. That with the very fact that he can speak up to seven languages fluently, English, Spanish, French, Malay, Arabic, Kikongo. It's further demonstrated within the tapes just exactly how skilled this young guy is for his age. Then the White Mamba showed up. He was faster and stronger than them, a better soldier, and he knew how to lead. I guess somebody wished upon a star, because their savior turned up like stardust straight out of the blue. The moment he arrived, the kids had their new commander. That was when they started attacking other villages. Word of the infamous White Mamba spread fast. But it isn't just his combat skills that got people talking. As you can tell from the name, he's the only light-skinned kid in the unit. Not to mention the blonde hair and the blue eyes. Not common in those parts. We have no idea where he came from or what he's experienced. The kid's a huge blank. There was three parasite vials, however one of the vials was destroyed by Venom in a fire and another was taken by Psycho Mantis that was given to Liquid Snake. As for the third, who was used to infect Quiet. As for Liquid, it's still really unclear why he didn't use it at Mother Base, knowing that he could have taken down the supposed Big Boss there and then. Bear in mind that Eli is a child, and whilst he may possess a connection to the parasites, he lacks the knowledge and control over them. The vocal cord parasites are a complex biological weapons with intricate mechanisms. Eli, despite his potential influence, may not have led the capability to fully command or utilize them effectively. It goes without saying that such virus shouldn't fall into the wrong hands such as Liquid who's carrying a great deal of resentment, one can only imagine the plans that he would be thinking to use for such parasite. The events surrounding Eli and the parasites are influenced by various forces, including Cypher and other third parties. Eli's actions may be constrained or manipulated by external factors, which could explain why he doesn't immediately use the parasites against Mother Base. There were three. Where's the other? Very close. To you. As some of you may be aware, the cut content known as the Kingdom of Flies, which was the content that was removed by Konami, the developers wanted to keep the Eli's Parasite as a plot device that could be used in future games or DLCs. The developers also wanted to make Eli's Parasites more mysterious and ambiguous as it raises questions about his origin, his connection to Big Boss and his role in Cypher's plans. Whatever the reasons, Eli's Parasite remains one of the most intriguing aspects of his character and the story. It also adds to the theme of identity and memory in Metal Gear Solid 5, as Eli struggles with his past and his future. The very organization of which that controlled Liquid's future and his genetic code to make him what he was 
Cypher would also have their part to play within Mission 51, as we noticeably see them wearing hazmat suits. It appears that Liquid Snake has affected the island with the parasites. Of course, he himself is wearing a hazmat suit, but being a kid and not understanding how to utilize these parasites to get his revenge against the world would end up infecting himself. I knew you'd be through here! You're not a kid anymore. You can call your own shots. But at this rate, you'll be dead before you have a chance. I'm free to die however I wish. Yes. Free! Father, I'll break the curse of my heritage. And to do that, first, I will kill you! A battle between Liquid and Venom Snake would ensue, and with that, Venom Snake would defeat the likes of Liquid and the Metal Gear. Trying to rescue Liquid from XOF would end up shooting Liquid, but because of the blast and his seizure would cause him to see colors faded into white, in mistaking him for being one of the XOF soldiers. Stupidly, one of the Diamond Dog soldiers thought it was a good idea to take his mask off, exposing him to the English strain of the parasite. He'll be all right. The best of the boy. Get him on the chopper. We'll patch him up at base. Huh? <gasps> Boss, he's showing symptoms. Huh? What? <gasps> It's unclear whether Liquid infected himself with the parasites or if he just released it within the area, but one thing is for certain, he wanted to defeat what he believed to be Big Boss. And along with Cypher, the very organization that cursed his genetics and fated him to not have his own destiny. You're one hell of a soldier. I will kill you! That's right. Don't blame yourself. Blame me. In understanding Liquid Snake's longing to be close to Big Boss as a son, one can emphasize with the human dimension underlying the genetically complex narrative is actions and anger become a poignant expression of a profound desire for familiar connection, recognition, and the emotional closeness that transcends the scientific experiment that defined their relationship. It also makes you wonder that with the bullet being with inside the gun, why didn't Liquid Snake try to take an attempt to take Venom's life? Although considering he probably would have been put down before he would have got the chance, but it still makes you wonder that why was he hesitant to at least try. The same thing could be said when he had the parasite back at Mother Base. It seems like he is hesitant to try and kill who he believes is his father, Big Boss, wanting that close connection. But in the Metal Gear Solid series, Liquid Snake and Psycho Mantis share a close and unique connection, primarily explored in Metal Gear Solid 1, but mostly within Metal Gear Solid 5 in my opinion. Both characters play crucial roles in the game's narrative, and their connection is deeply rooted in their shared past. Like Liquid, Psycho Mantis is a psychic child who was experimented on by the Patriots and Skullface. With the ability to read emotions and thoughts of others and manipulate them to his will, he also has the ability to control machines and weapons with his mind. But by diving into Liquid's mind, he could find a close connection from within their shared experiences and past that would bind these two together as brothers. The connection they both share is deep-rooted through bad emotions, but one that would connect them nonetheless for that long sense of longing to need it to be wanted and to be recognized. Given on all what we see for the Metal Gear franchise, there is no winners or losers, there is no good or bad. 
Evil is not just born, evil is also made through experiences. Liquid did have a point, he was determined by his very genetics that got him involved with this messy affair. Else many don't understand that yes people have the free will to decide their own fate, it was written within Liquid's genetics to be this specific way, to be nothing more than a soldier, a pawn of war. But with his newfound brothership with Psycho Mantis, he would eventually find his own family in the unit that is Foxhound. All of which are people that were subjected to the torture and abuse of experiments from an evil malevolent force that tried to control the world. Not yet. It's not over yet. And a slight disclaimer for those who can't read between the lines. Yes, I'm aware that this is Zanzibar land and this is Solid Snake, but there isn't no footage to describe the likes of Liquid's involvement within Foxhound, so you'll just have to bear with it. So this is where the timeline becomes a little bit blurry, as we don't know exactly of when Liquid Snake joined the organization of Foxhound during the early days when Big Boss was in charge. We do know that he had some involvement within Foxhound, because he became the eventual leader that we all know within Shadow Moses. With that organization being created by Big Boss, it's fair to say that Big Boss himself must have appointed Liquid to be a certain commander of a section of the units within Foxhound. But it's most likely the fact that after the events of Zanzibar when Solid Snake defeated Big Boss, that Liquid Snake himself appointed himself to take control of the Foxhound unit and take it onto his own initiative. I'm quite certain at some point Liquid Snake did meet Big Boss. And during Metal Gear Solid 1, Liquid reveals that he was the one Father chose, implying he was always led to believe that he possessed the inferior recessive genes. It also implies that Big Boss at some point must have given him this information, confirming that perhaps they did meet. But, I'm the one Father chose. So that's why you're so obsessed with Big Boss. Some warped kind of love. Love? It's hate! He always told me I was inferior. We are aware that a portion of Foxhound was recruited by Big Boss. Sniper Wolf was rescued from her harsh upbringing by Big Boss, who raised her as a soldier. She eventually came to look up to Big Boss, whom she called Saladin. It's not exactly confirmed within the Metal Gear franchise, but it's one that we can put together like a puzzle. That being, of course, that Big Boss had a secret secondary Foxhound unit that he had to his disposal that we was unaware of, including Solid Snake. We know that Zero took the genetics of Big Boss as an insurance policy after Big Boss left the unit. That unit, of course, being Cypher as the project The Terrible Children would be used as an insurance policy against Big Boss in the future. I believe that Liquid Snake was taken under the wing of Big Boss alongside the rest of the newly found Foxhound unit from Shadow Moses, in order to stir his anger and his resentment towards those who made him as a way to fight back against the Patriots. Most of us are aware that Big Boss's greatest ally is Ocelot, and Ocelot was a part of the newly formed Foxhound during Shadow Moses in which I believe this unit itself was already established during the events of Zanzibar, or maybe just after the events of Phantom Pain in between Outer Heaven. If one thing is for certain, Ocelot has always assisted Big Boss throughout all his endeavors and all of his military coup d'etats to face the Patriots. We know that Ocelot at some point perhaps maybe even recruited Liquid Snake to appoint him to help the likes of Big Boss in this Foxhound unit. Of course, why wouldn't Liquid Snake gladly accept? After all, it's a perfect way to get close to his father that he had been longing for. We know that Liquid Snake had his own motives, and by being able to be close to Big Boss, he realized he could have taken advantage of the very fact that he could use his Big Boss's powers to be able to turn it against him and try surpass his father and to try claim all the military assets that Big Boss had acquired, but unfortunately wouldn't be able to do so as Solid Snake would take Big Boss out. Confirms my point to why Liquid Snake is also very resentful towards Solid Snake. You should understand me, brother. You killed our father with your own hands. You stole my chance for revenge. Now I'll finish the work that father began. I will surpass him. I will destroy him. I also know that with a new foxhound that was formed in Shadow Moses, that the likes of Ocelot would be the right-hand man of Liquid. 
and at the end of Metal Gear Solid 5 Phantom Pain, that confirms it all the more, as Ocelot suggests that at some point that both of his sons will most likely want to settle the score with Big Boss. With Ocelot acting as an overseer for Liquid, it makes sense why he could have an established connection with Big Boss during the secondary Foxhound units that was established that was kept hidden and unseen. Since Big Boss was using Liquid as a way to get back at Cypher, and also Liquid in using Big Boss to try and gain his military power and control of his military factions, hence being the leader of Foxhound during the events of Shadow Moses. Sooner or later, there will be only one boss. There's only room for one boss. His sons are fated to face each other someday too. If the day ever comes that you go back to Cypher, I'll lay the other son. And then you and I will be enemies too. One of us will have to kill the other. Fine by me. Liquid Snake's descent into his mental unstability and madness is a multifaceted journey intricately woven in the narrative fabric of Metal Gear Solid. Driven by a combination of genetic predisposition, personal insecurities, and a tumultuous past, Liquid's transformation is a formidable antagonist is a tragic tale of identity and betrayal and the relentless pursuit of self-assertion. His ever-growing resentment is what fuels his desire to prove himself superior, ultimately leading him down a dark path. The sense of betrayal by those who orchestrated his existence deepens his resentment, pushing him towards an existential crisis where he questions the authenticity of his own agency. Liquid's background as a former member of the British SAS Special Air Service and his role as a field commander of Foxhound showcases exceptional military leadership. His tactical acumen and ability to command a diverse group of elite soldiers, each with unique skills, made him a formidable adversary. His leadership extends to the orchestration of complex operations, including the takeover of Shadow Moses Island. There is a reason he is the leader of such unit. He really does carry the powerful genetics of Big Boss, which makes him stand out from the rest of his unit that widely respect him. He is just as you said. In battle, he is as if possessed by a demon, much like you. I would expect no less. You're the boss's brother, all right. Your brother, he's an amazing man. Who else could shoot down two F-16s with a hind helicopter? The Les Enfanteries project was not a total failure. He is the one man who could make my dream into a reality. Unlike Liquid, Solid Snake was a pawn of the Patriots at the time, unaware of his position and his mission for what exactly the Patriots intended him to do. Through information supplied by a spy in the Pentagon, Liquid learned that Octopus and Baker's deaths had been caused by Fox Die, the very weapon that targets specific individuals, a DI assassination virus which Solid Snake had secretly been infected with. With his cunning abilities to be able to use manipulation in terms of using Master Miller's codec, he would manipulate the likes of Snake to get the information that he needed by ordering Ocelot to kill Commander Miller for him to get the additional intel that he needed to find out exactly the purpose of Fox Die and why it is that half of the people within the facility are succumbing to these deaths when Solid Snake is present. Liquid's vision was more than a mere thirst for power. It was a rebellion against the unseen strings of geopolitical manipulation and the assertion of the soldiers' wills against the machinations of governments and secret societies. Through his calculated maneuvers and charismatic leadership, Liquid Snake transformed Shadow Moses into a battleground where the echoes of genetic legacies and the clash of military ideologies reverberated, forever altering the landscape within Metal Gear Solid. Liquid demanded the powers that be, the Patriots, add a vaccine for Fox Die to Foxhound's demands, along with $1 billion to help correct the genome soldiers' mutations, using information gathered from Big Boss's DNA, deciding to play the superpowers against one another rather than take them head on, demonstrating his great military strategy. We've got the most powerful weapon ever made, and we're about to ally with Galukovic's forces. Are you going to fight the whole world? And what's wrong with that? We can launch a nuclear warhead at any target on this planet. A nuclear warhead invisible to radar. And on top of that, this base is full of spare nuclear warheads. Once we get the DNA and the money, the world will be ours! What about your promise to Colonel Golukovich? I have no interest in the revival of Mother Russia. You're not thinking of reviving Big Boss's dream. From today, call this place... 
Outer Heaven. Genome soldiers share a common genetic heritage with Liquid as they are all products of the cloning experiment that replicated the DNA of the legendary soldier Big Boss. This genetic brotherhood forms the foundation of Liquid's connections to the soldier, creating an intricate web of familities that goes beyond the conventional bonds forged on the battlefield. Liquid's empathy for the genome soldiers is fueled by their shared struggles embedded in their genetic destinies. Much like him, they grapple with the burden of predetermined fates and the expectations thrust upon them as products of a genetic manipulation. This shared narrative of identity crisis and a quest for validation forms a basis for his care and concern of the genome soldiers. Simultaneously, Liquid's care for the genome soldiers can be seen as a manifestation of his rebellion against the legacy of Big Boss. While he despises the perceived genetic inferiority passed down to him, he finds solace and purpose in leading soldiers who share the same genetic makeup. In a twisted way, caring for the genome soldiers become a form of defiance against the very legacy that he resents. The genome soldiers? That's right. They are our brothers, created artificially through the alignment of nucleotides to mimic our father's genes. They too are the product of numerous sacrifices. Sacrifices? Human experiments! 1991, the Gulf War. The military secretly injected soldiers with the soldier genes. The Gulf War syndrome that hundreds of thousands of returning soldiers complained about was a side effect of it. Ultimately, Liquid Snake's madness descended him into complete destruction, including his ultimate demise. He and Solid Snake really did share the same kind of mindset of wanting to eventually destroy the Patriots. At the time, Solid Snake was none the wiser, fulfilling the Patriots' duty in order to assassinate Liquid as he was a threat to their very organization. Liquid's motives was right in a way, but the way he wanted to bring around the end of the Patriots was very destructive and could have landed the world into a third world war, making the destruction of the Earth very plausible. Aside from the fact that the Patriots wanted to enslave the entire existence of the world, Liquid's views on the matter was very extreme, to the point of all of his conflicting emotions, quite naturally, would make him make the very wrong decisions instead of trying to destroy the Patriots in a way that would make sense and keep the infrastructure intact. There's no doubt that with Liquid Snake's deeply rooted problems, he also is the ultimate hypocrite. As when Snake mentions about him being just as bad as Naomi when it comes to revenge, Quid Snake would naturally disagree, but then also contradicts himself later within the conversation. No doubt. But I had no idea she was motivated by such petty revenge. And now I'll have my revenge! <laughs> you should understand me, brother. You killed our father with your own hands! You stole my chance for revenge! Now I'll finish the work that father began. I will surpass him. I will destroy him. You're just like Naomi. Liquid Snake's motives, naturally to the latter of what I've been speaking about, is also fueled by revenge. Things like from within, he has truly lost his mind, and the descent of conflicting emotions has clouded his judgments. Aside from wanting to settle the score with Solid Snake, it was a means to an end. In a sense, he had no choice but to defeat his very own brother, but on the fact that Snake is the carrier of the Fox Die virus, which would infect and kill Liquid Snake. In essence, Liquid Snake was right in his point of view, in his shoes, to want to fight his own brother, who was a vector and a very weapon that would eliminate him. Following orders blindly with no questions asked, you've lost your warrior's pride and become nothing more than a palm snake. What? Stopping the nuclear launch, rescuing the hostages, it was all just a diversion. A diversion? The Pentagon only needed for you to come into contact with us. That's what killed the arms tech president and decoy octopus. You don't mean... That's right. You were sent here to kill us so they could retrieve Metal Gear undamaged, along with the bodies of the genome soldiers. From the beginning, the Pentagon was just using you as a vector to spread Fox Die. The eyes aflame, reflecting the turmoil of a soul bound by the chains of heritage, both his resents and yearns to transcend. Liquid strides with purpose, his every step is a testament to the relentless pursuit of an elusive identity and externally eclipsed by a towering legend of Big Boss that would further descend him into madness, in a sense, wanting to span the flames of war just like his father, a place where soldiers are needed. 
in an essence being part of the bad human condition known as war that leads to nothing but destruction and death. Liquid in an essence became all the things that he hated. It took a toll on him and in fact it became a part of his identity. The very fact that he wished to become bigger and beyond Big Boss in order to continue the means of war. Whereas a solid snake wanted to try and stop war in a means of fighting it to take out evil corporations. Since Liquid Snake wanted to continue the cycle of war. Unlike his brother who wished to stop war and was a pacifist deep down inside. Just because you've destroyed Metal Gear doesn't mean I'm done fighting. Fighting? What are you really after? A world where warriors like us are honored as we once were. As we should be. That was Big Boss's fantasy. It was his dying wish. <sighs> when he was young, during the Cold War, the world needed men like us. We were valued then. We were desired. But things oh, are different now. With all the liars and hypocrites running the world, war isn't what it used to be. We're losing our place in a world that no longer needs us. Snake! Tragic Ballad of Brothers, Liquid Snake's seeming lack of choices becomes a mirror reflecting the complexities of identity, agency, and the profound struggle against the deterministic currents of genetic fate. In the final moments of their conflict, sympathy for Liquid transcends the battlefield, echoing a lament for a soul, ensnared in a dance where choices are illusionary and the destinies are inexorably entwined. The strains of Liquid Symphony fade into the cold winds of Shadow Moses, there lingers a sense of tragic vindication, his rebellion born from the crucible of genetic manipulation and the weight of the legendary name, paints him not as a conventional antagonist but as a soul yearning for anticipation for the predetermined narrative woven in his very DNA. In this somber notes of his tale, there lies a whisper of empathy for Liquid, Snake a protagonist in the untold chapters of a story defined by cruel strokes of genetic destiny. One thing is very telling at the end of Metal Gear Solid 1, it tells us that we shouldn't be defined by our genes, that we can shape our own future. In a sense, Naomi puts it brilliantly well in a poetic and very philosophical way about how genetics really do work and how we do have the free will to decide our own fate. But in the case of Liquid, that is up for debate. One thing is for certain, given on his life path, the very fundamental thing that it is to be human, the good part of human life, such as love and compassion, Liquid Snake was void and without. Living is a link to the future. That's how all life works. Loving each other, teaching each other. That's how we can change the world. I finally realized it. The true meaning of life. Thank you, Snake. Yes, the inferior one was the winner after all. Right, until the very end, Liquid thought he was the inferior one. With the death of Liquid, his legacy would still continue to span throughout the Metal Gear franchise. It wasn't over yet, and Liquid Snake would still live on. I, I live on through this arm! Liquid's on. <laughs> Liquid's legacy would continue through the span of the Metal Gear franchise, in living on specifically through Ocelot. Questionable debates throughout the franchise between the Metal Gear community if Liquid actually did take full possession of Ocelot during the time of Metal Gear Solid 2 when his arm was transplanted onto Ocelot. Something that goes overlooked is that Liquid really did play a part in shutting down the Patriots control system that would enslave the planet. And as I explained, many people speculate if it was actually Liquid Snake if it wasn't just Ocelot resuming the role of Liquid Snake through a combination of nanomachine manipulations and hypnosis. One thing that some people will agree on is the fact that it doesn't make sense how someone can be controlled through somebody's arm. It's not genetically or physically possible. 
But hey, it's Hideo Kojima's work, so what do we expect? But one thing is for clear that submits the fact that Liquid probably did take control of Ocelot's body during Metal Gear 2 is the noticeable voice changing when Ocelot has his spasms, which is clearly evident that it is Liquid Snake. So it's up for debate whether you think it's just a possession of Liquid Snake or whether Ocelot did just act the role that he played in order to fool the Patriots. <laughs> It's happening again. This damn right arm. Liquid! It's almost as if it's having its revenge. How much do you think we spent on that arm in Lyon? The best transplant surgery team in the world. I never trust a Frenchman. There's something going on. The incidents are becoming more frequent. Maybe that man's presence. If Liquid Snake truly did live on through Ocelot, he would serve as being a vessel. Ocelot being the vessel to carry out the particular destiny of what I think Liquid Snake always intended to do. Aside from being fascinated and following Big Boss's will, his true nature and his true intentions was to take down the very organization that cursed him of his genetic heritage. And just in a slight disclaimer guys, this is just me basing what I think on evidence that I've gathered together and through speculation that Liquid Snake really had the best of intentions to destroy the very organization that has manipulated many of the characters and the events through the Metal Gear Solid franchise. There is no doubt that Liquid Snake has an over unhealthy amount of ego in which he always finds himself in competition still with his brother but his intentions wanted to take the glory of being able to shut down the very thing that Solid Snake is doing himself. And his anger towards Solid Snake is won through his jealousy in the fact that he himself wants to take what he believes is his rightful revenge that he should claim from those who stole his birthright. Brothers! Liquid! I've been waiting for this! It can't be! I've been inside this arm all along, waiting for the right time to awaken! You were inside Ocelot? Yes, a sleeper in the arm of a Patriot spy! It was you two years ago? Exactly! I was controlling him! Snake, it was I that leaked information about Arsenal to your partner and got you out here. What? You're the only one that can free me. After all... I'm off to bury the Patriots for good. You know where they are? How? Why do you think I chose Arsenal as my host? But before I go, I have a family matter to settle with both of you. There's room for only one snake and one big boss. Around the events of Guns of the Patriots, Ocelot would retain the personality and being the mental doppelganger of Liquid. It's evident to note that throughout Guns of the Patriots, we can clearly see that Liquid's involvement is no longer a thing, as we don't once see a voice change that simplifies that Liquid is still present with inside Ocelot's body through possession. And Ocelot no longer contains Liquid's arm. In fact, he would transplant it with a cybergenetic prosthetic. Whilst Liquid Sneak is no longer present, we get a good understanding at the end of Metal Gear Solid 2 of what his true intentions are. And after when he says to Snake, only you can set me free, after all. Implying that since he is no longer around, since he's dead, that Solid Snake can continue to fulfill the revenge that Liquid sought for against the Patriots. Freeing him from his cursed heritage. Freeing him from his anger, his resentment. Whilst the three clones, Solid Snake, Liquid Snake, and Solidus, might have been divided through ideologies, one thing they all agreed on was destroying the Patriots. The only two people that could continue Liquid's legacy to be able to give the revenge that he needed and sought for was Solid Snake and Ocelot. It's the very fact as well that Ocelot fooled the Patriot system into thinking that he was Liquid Snake, giving him the access he needs in order for Solid Snake to complete his mission as he intended to finally destroy the Patriot enslavement system. Which is evidently shown when Solid Snake asks Liquid, why did you stop us? When Ocelot replies, why would I want to do that? Implying that they all had the same goals in mind. Why? You, you could have stopped us. 
stopped you. Why would I want to do that? This is just as I'd hoped things would end. We are beasts created by man. Unless the light is put out, the shadows cannot be erased. So long as there is light, erasing shadows will do no good. <laughs> As we bid farewell to Liquid Snake, it's impossible to ignore the echoes of his final stand. A desperate attempt to defy the puppet strings that bound him in a world where power struggles unfold against a backdrop of geopolitical machinations. Liquid's rebellion becomes a testament to the human spirit's indomitable will. The farewell is tinged with emotion as we witness layers of the complexity within Liquid's characters unravel. His journey, marked by sibling rivalry, genetic manipulation, and the burden of Big Boss's legacy concludes not in a blaze of villainous glory, but in a quiet revelation. In the end, Liquid Snake, despite the twisted path he trod, yearned for a semblance over control of his own narrative, a desire that resonates with the universal longing for self-determination. As the echoes of Metal Gear's dismantling fade away, Liquid Snake's farewell becomes a narrative punctuation, an emotional exclamation, point in the story rich with sympathy of humanity's struggles. In the silence that follows, we reflect on Liquid's complex journey, acknowledging the shades of grey that define his character, and in bidding farewell, we recognize that even within the heart of a so-called antagonist, there beats a human pulse, a testament to the emotional depth that elevates Metal Gear Solid beyond the confines of a mere video game, leaving an incredible impression on those who've traversed the corridors of its intricate narrative. So the question is, was Liquid Snake right? Well, that's up for you guys to determine. Be sure to leave me a comment in the section down below as per usual. And I'm your host of Voicebox, and until we meet again. I told them, last chance to face the world with no regrets. Last chance. You better be ready for your drag back here. Ready to face the world as enemies. <laughs>